My story um, in learning about urban migrants, urban migration, and the whole process of urban development in the informal sector of India, which um, I'll emphasize throughout my talk, the informal sector is that part of the economy that is not legally registered. It's actually still the fastest growing part of the Indian economy today. Um, started in villages in Maharashtra state and Tamil Nadu in southern India uh, because I had a very special privilege. Some of you here from the business world in particular will know a very famous um, uh, Indian uh, immigrant to the United States, Professor C.K. Prahalad, who was one of the great business thinkers of the last century um, on a global scale. And C.K. Professor Prahalad was the late C.K. Prahalad. Um, was writing a book uh, called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, Eliminating Poverty Through Profits. And we had met one another. He asked me to review the manuscript and comment, and that led to a relationship. And so we decided that we should start a little consulting practice to help global companies figure out how to put the promise of serving underserved populations, the four billion people that live on $2 uh, a day, um, through uh, business, and we, uh, of course, had our first clients because it was C.K. Prahalad in India. Um, and this picture here uh, was my first project. It was with BP. And the problem we were trying to solve was to eliminate respiratory disease in village huts, particularly women, the highest rate of respiratory disease uh, in the world um, because of the use of poor use of biomass fuels. And, um, I was charged with ethnographic research, market research in this area, and you see here in this hut a woman using a set of very traditional uh, cooking means. In fact, it's very sophisticated. There's a number of burners there. She uses uh, cow dung cakes for one thing and sticks for another thing and straw for another thing in order to cook the quite complex uh, Indian cuisine. And what was interesting when you went to these huts and you try to figure out who's my customer, who's going to buy this smokeless biomass stove that we're designing for our client VP, and you went into the next room, you realized that something else was happening. Or if you went to the neighbor's hut, there was something quite different happening. Oftentimes in huts, there were those that were just biomass huts, and there were those that had brought gas in. And not only brought gas in, but they had these interesting little arrangements. Like, look at that vegetable arrangement on the wall there. Now, that's kind of curious. It looks like it, to me, it looked like it was out of some kind of magazine, that someone had looked at a magazine and they thought, this is how we ought to arrange our house. And what we did, and the reason I'm going into this, is, is it led me to study uh, migrants to the cities in India from the villages. And that in order to um, serve our clients, who were BP and Thomson Reuters, uh, Thomson Reuters and Britannia, a big uh, uh, fast moving consumer goods company there, others. Um, we had to discern who's the customer who's going to be there five years from now. Because India is a country that over the last 50 years, in terms of urban population growth, more than 70% of that population growth over the last 50 years has been from urban migration. It, the rate of that is slowing down, but it still attributes probably around half of the popu urban population growth in India today. And we had to understand for our own clients who's going to be our customer in a few years' time. And how might, might we follow those who won't be the customer to the city. So we developed a set of methodologies for being able to look at a house and the decorations and what the house is made of and where people are working and what their occupations were and what they were doing with their kids in terms of schooling. And you could say this person's going to the city and this person's going to stay in the village, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not uncommon in terms of doing market research in India. So I decided to, on the side, use the four and a half years I was doing these projects in India to actually interview um, scores of urban migrants um, starting in the village, these types of households, and follow them on a journey, not the same people, but go to all the stopping points on the migration path into the city and really understand what their strategy was and why they were doing what they were doing. So here's in a village in Maharashtra, around Solapur district, if some of you know Maharashtra state. Um, a woman, she's an elderly woman, not the one you see in the picture, but the woman who owns and lives in this hut. She's a grandmother. Uh, she's, I don't know, 60, 70 years old, quite old. Um, and you see what kinds of conditions she's living in in the village. Um, go inside of her hut um, and you see interesting things. She's got income generation from farming. She's doing sewing. She's got a television set there. Now, she's not going to migrate, but we learned that she has six businesses she's invested in. Uh, sons and nephews, and some of them are invested in the city. So one of them is an auto rickshaw driver in Sholapur. And so what we begin to see here is a woman who 
um, is quite distinct in the village. She's not just doing an agricultural life. She's an investor. She's a small business developer, and she's got a network and a family, and it's connecting her up with the city. Um, and so if we move fast track um, from the rural area to this place, which we're going to explore in quite a bit of detail, it's no surprise that um, what she does to survive and invest and advance the interests of her family in the countryside, she builds something or they build something uh, as they migrate into the city, and this is now in Mumbai, that there's a form of building that's there. Um, it's taking the hut and it's putting it in the city. And around the world, urban migrants, if you look at their so-called slums, what they're doing is taking what they could do with the materials available in the city and they're building a village within the city um, for a set of purposes we'll explore, explore at length. Um, for decades, um, sociologists and uh, economists and um, others have argued that they're moving to the city because there are these huge forces pushing them. You know, they're not agents in their lives. Um, they're being pushed by drought or they're being pushed by you know, division of land in the family or they're being pulled by the bright lights of the city or by getting a job in the city. And what I found, and I'll fast track a bit to my conclusion and then we can explore it and hopefully debate it later. What I found is that actually the more compelling argument was that they're agents, that they have a strategy for how to improve the condition of their family and that moving to the city and moving out of one steel scrap hut in the village to another steel scrap hut in a different place is part of a strategy they have that works. And it's on that basis that millions and millions of people uh, in India uh, in you know, five or six years ago, the last count, about 65 million people in India are living in huts like this in cities. In fact, they have a strategy for what I call and describe at length in my book for gaining advantage from urban location and from gaining advantage from becoming city builders as opposed to just rural builders. And along the way, there's a lot of hardship, which we know about. You might not have scrap metal. In fact, you might not have a location when you first get to the city, so you can get a plastic tarp. Uh, this is now central south Mumbai. Um, and as you develop a business, you can uh, engage in the rough and tumble and rough with capital letters, rough and tumble process of securing a business location along a busy street where you'll also sleep at night. Um, and if you're fortunate, you will secure a place within what we call a slum today. Um, there are many, many studies that have been done, and this is not just from India, but studies I cite and that you can research yourselves as geographers, South Africa, Colombia, of urban migrants. Urban migrants are a unique breed. They are a self-selected um, segment of the population in rural areas um, that tend to be extremely risk-taking and entrepreneurial. And you can look at studies around the world and find that the people who are born into a city, whether it's Joburg or Mumbai, have a higher chance of being in poverty than the migrants to the city. So there's something distinct about the migrant and the fact that they have a strategy for what they want to do in the city. That they're not just willy-nilly sort of getting pushed and pulled around and hoping to land on their feet. They know what they're going for the city to do. In fact, there's been a pathway of migrants that they've learned from. There's continuous learning about how to gain advantage from urban location. And this drives, um, and I won't go into it in great deal because detail here because I want to stay focused on India. Um, drives the whole process of urban growth globally. Uh, it drives uh, migrant not just from the village to Mumbai, but from Mumbai to Dubai or from Madurai, which I'll talk about, to, um, to, to London. The connecting of cities, the remittance flows, the uh, development of new business models uh, around the world. I just realized I wanted to read something to you at the end. Um, but within India, this growth rate is an amazing an amazing challenge. So if we look at how many new urban dwellers there will be in India um, over the next 40 or so years, sorry, 30, 35 years, 485 million new people who will need to secure some place to live and some way to earn a living within Indian cities within the next 35 years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 60 million today living in slums. So the question is, how does a country that's becoming an urban nation that by 2044 or thereabouts will have more than half of its population living in cities, how do you prepare for that? 
how do you mobilize the resources to build urban spaces and urban livelihoods for 485 million people? Um, and this is the challenge that I think we all try to wrap our heads around. I have a point of view about it. I don't think it's a quick fix. I don't think it's the only fix. But I think it's got to be an important part of the portfolio, and I'll make that argument to you now. So what is this strategy? Why is it that cities offer an advantage to the people who are not just poor, but they're from the lowest castes in India as well. So in terms of social status, um, not much advantage as well. Why, why go to the city? And I argue that from an economic geography point of view, there are basic advantages that drive everyone to cities. That doesn't matter whether you're a global company or with, whether you're a poor villager. And um, the first basic advantage is density. That by co-locating and concentrating activities, you actually optimize the use of space in a way that you can't do in low density settlement, whether that's a village or it's a suburb. So you walk around Mumbai and there's the mango sellers or there's the spinach sellers or there. Why do they cluster together? Why would they want to set up a cart right next to their competition? It seems counterintuitive to us, but if you walk around our own cities and think, why are all the tailors all clustered together? Why are certain types of restaurants all clustered together? They're clustered together to create proxy economies of scale. They're trying to create enough of a draw, enough of a market in order to create some mini agglomeration economies, which is the core driver of the city. So these people who are probably migrants themselves, they know that works. Um, here's an interesting example. One of the hotels I stayed at in Mumbai was in a, a newly developed area in Andheri. And not only was there a new Hyatt hotel there, but there was a whole office park developing in this area. So over a period of three years of coming and going to that place, I got to watch what happened. There is, of course, any time there's development, there's a kind of a, a slum that gets built up for the workers who are working on the development site. And they kind of settle in. And then the men are working, but the women have to figure out what to do for a living. And I'm watching what's going on along the street. And within three years' time, the sides of this street are occupied by flower sellers. A massive market of flower sellers, self-organized by people who live in slums who live on the street. So you see, um, it's probably about 500 feet on each side of the road there. That's pure, those, those are office plants that are being sold there. So out of the blue, Mumbai provides an opportunity for I don't know how many flower sellers I did, was coming and going and didn't do the interviews and studying this, but probably scores maybe 100 flower sellers to establish a livelihood within the city. So th that's an, a basic economic potential of cities to create concentration um, and agglomeration of economic activities that empower the poorest people with the least amount of capital to find a livelihood together, to create a market together. The next thing they do is not just claim a bit of land and agglomerate together, but they co-locate a set of things together in order to reduce their cost structure. So now we're in Dharavi, the now very famous slum uh, because of Slumdog uh, Millionaire, and it's a place now where you can do slum tourism, um, so it's quite well known. But there's a reason people do slum tourism there, because these people have invented um, a degree of economic efficiency in the way that they use their resources and the way they use their urban location and land, which I think the whole world uh, can learn from. And I argued in the Economic Times of India that this ought to be uh, rather than torn down uh, a World Heritage Site, because India and the world have so much to learn from the organic development of efficiency in this place. And I'm not trying to make this seem beautiful, and I'm going to talk about how unbeautiful it is. I'm going to show some pictures. But just to think about the economic logic of it. So here's a woman from the Kumbar um, uh, caste uh, in Gujarat. They're potters by tradition. Uh, they have created their village within Dravi, which is uh, a slum of many villages doing a variety of uh, industrial activities. And what they've done here is co-located their housing and their business activity and the creche for the children and their temple. And so everything is maximally efficient in terms of time efficiency. There's no expense that they bear to get to work. Um, the children can do manual work. They can do income generating activity when they're not at school. There's not a need for an automobile. So there's tremendous efficiency here in the way that they use urban resources. And here in North America, we're moving towards you know, how to stop zoning and separating functions and how we get back to mixed use. Well, this is sort of the optimal, painful, painful optimal of economic efficiency of mixed use within 
the slum. So that's density, co-location, uh, concentrating activities together, basic efficiencies. That allows scaling. So there's enough net wealth that's generated out of that economic potential that allows this market to scale itself. And so here's now kind of the broader view of Dharavi. You know, people estimate numbers. Let's say it's 800,000 people um, living in this self-built settlement, which 40 or 50 years ago, if I'm <coughs> quoting my numbers correctly, was a marsh. Right? It was an unsettled marsh. It wasn't even land that you could settle on. People filled the land. These villagers, these migrants, built this place. Um, and within Dharavi, because of scale economies, now you have people who came with no capital. Um, there is capital that's cycled in there. I'm going to talk about criminality and money laundering and extortion and the criminal world that happens there that capitalizes this place because there's not access to formal capital to banks. So it now has a whole capital um, sector in it, I can say. But Dharavi has um, a highly uh, articulated economy, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary sectors. Right? Everything is happening there. Um, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, it has all of these uh, industrial activities in it. So here you get a view of how people are living in this um, a pottery sector. It's not nice. It's not a great way to live. It's not the way that Indians ought to live but they're making a living and they are serving a market because of scale economy. So they use the road corridors as their shopping malls where they sell their wares as traffic comes and goes. Um, they're the launderers for Mumbai. Um, so whole collectives of women who collect the laundry, laundry, get it taken back, very sophisticated business models which Siki Prahalad has written about. Um, they're the recyclers of Mumbai. Uh, they. Um, Another example of a recycling warehouse, I think, here. Um, they take some of the plastics that they recycle and they do amazing stuff. So this is inside a home. I'm sure this stuff is exported. It's not just sold in India. It's not a healthy way to work. Um, there's a lot of toxins that people are living with. The children are sleeping with fumes from gold smelting and things like that. Um, but the crafts that they have and the crafts that they learn through this mixing with one another um, creates incredible livelihood opportunity for them. Um, and now here's the quaternary sector. Because there's so much net wealth generated out of nothing, um, out of swampland and poor rural migrants, there are stores that specialize in selling tropical fish because you might want to have a tropical fish tank in your house in Dharavi. Um, you might want to go to the movie theater. You might want to go to the fairgrounds within Dharavi. So if you go to Dharavi, what one finds is a place that's an economy like any economy. It's, it's what we describe in uh, economics as a diversified economy. Um, there are big industries that scale even more. So one of the original groups uh, that settled in Dharavi um, was uh, Muslim families from um, Tamil Nadu. Uh, the, um, the abattoirs um, were on the outskirts in the swamps and they were fine with taking the skins and they were experts, they were goat herders from where they came from so they understood a good skin from a bad skin um, and they got into tannery business and this was the start of the tannery industry in, uh, in India. The tanneries have since come and gone but people are still doing amazing leather work there. The primary sector is here, there's the skins, the arbitrage is still there, they go and they pick the best skins, they clean the skins, they salt the skins, in the back you see where the guy sleeps at night not a hygienic way to live, but certainly an economical way to live. Um, here they're taking the guts from the sheep from the arbitoir, and that's a very interesting story. I hope I'm not grossing you out back there. Um, and cleaning the guts. What do you think the guts are used for? So now something else is going on in Dharavi. Johnson & Johnson has a surgical sutures plant in Dharavi, and they're cleaning the guts to sell to Johnson & Johnson. So something else is happening here now. Now they're tying up with multinational companies. Multinational companies are actually setting up manufacturing within Dharavi, very interesting. Here's, um, I write about this family, uh, the Khan family, um, that is in the skins business. And they've moved up the ladder from just doing pure tannery. The family now owns a tannery in, uh, in Madras um, and uh, in Chennai. And uh, they ship the sh skins, they dye them and things, they ship them to the family tannery in Chennai and make shoes with them down there. But the brother here takes the skins and has designers fly in from Paris, because this is, Dharavi's not very far from the airport, 
supply them from Paris, and the designers teach the stitchers how to stitch the collars on these $10,000 fashion leather jackets. And one of the brothers has stores in Atlanta and Southern Florida now. So they shipped them straight to the brother in Atlanta and Southern Florida. So here you see a strategy, right? Two generations ago, granddad migrates to Dharavi. He goes and he picks up skins and he cleans skins and he sells them to the tanneries. They get into the shoe business, then they somehow capitalize the tannery. Longer, longer story, there's more about that in the book. Then they move up, fashion garments, and now they're uh, part of the global, not only part of a global supply chain, um, they do make them for global brands as well, but then now they're retailing around the world. So two generations from being goat herders to having a company that has a website that you can visit, in my Enterprises. Um, they make 150 jackets per day. I guess that's about 40,000 per annum. The numbers on their website don't add up. I think they're not really totaling up the amount of income that they have. They didn't want to advertise on the website. Um, but you can see that they're selling to markets around the world. And this is two generations after migration to, to Mumbai. Um, sweatshops and Dharavi as well, tie-ups with global brands. Um, interesting thing about these types, we hear a lot about exploitation and the hazards of these sweatshops. One of the things that the global companies are doing by tying up with these um, small shots is they're actually driving standards. So what I found is both with Inma as they tie up with global companies, with this company as they, in textile uh, production and clothing production as they tie up, they move towards registration as formal businesses. They may still do half of their business informally, but they move towards formality, which is a step, further step up the ladder in terms of being able to be banked and to get loans and that sort of thing. Um, so density, scale, scaling up um, to a global scale. One of the other things that happens, and I talked about it in terms of caste in different caste groups developing particular industrial uh, specialties, um, is they also organize as industrial communities. So now, of developers, that's very prime land in Dravi. They would like to tear down the so-called slum and redevelop it. It's, it would be very profitable to do so, and it could be used for a variety of other uses. There's no question about that. But they are very, very organized. And I think it's highly unlikely that Dravi will ever get torn down, because, in particular because of the tannery industry uh, and the leather industry there. So here's just a picture you know, to sort of emphasize. This looks chaotic. This doesn't look like uh, industry. Here are all the seat, uh, street trading that's happening down further in old southern Mumbai. Uh, the uh, Reliance uh, Company, the largest conglomerate, I think, now in India, the Ambani family, decided that they needed to do something about food retail in India, uh, given that there were more than 12 million unorganized small retailers in India, and they weren't providing economies, efficiencies of scale. And when they started setting up shops in cities, uh, the so-called unorganized small street retailers uh, revolted and politically in some, one of the states, uh, the Reliant shops were shut down. So um, the ability to do political organization at the scale of the city and to represent one's interests economically at the scale of the city is quite different than at the village scale as well. And we've seen this around the world, and it's why I call my book Welcome to the Urban Revolution, is we can see this path from migration to um, creating industrial livelihoods through migration through these core economies of the city. And if you think about the revolutions that we've witnessed over the last 40 years, they often have their roots in that sort of a pathway, certainly Detroit, migration from the south to become uh, industrial um, uh, population, African Americans in Iran, I write about that, South Africa, et cetera. Uh, happening in China today with urban migration um, as people try to claim uh, uh, their space um, and their maintain their economic activities uh, within cities in China. Um, and then finally, with this level of organization, with this kind of core underlying economics, you can export these models globally, right? Uh, Hezbollah um, and has exported its model to Egypt, has exported its model to many places in the world. Uh, and, and Hezbollah is an interesting case, which I write about uh, in Lebanon, and that they gained power through getting control of urban districts and supplying urban districts, running the gas stations, many, many things. So um, this kind of uh, nasty side of the potential of cities that are informally organized is something we all need to contend with. So to um, paraphrase a former president of our country, it's about their strategy, stupid. So when we come to thinking about, well, how are we going to help 485 million people um, gain a decent 
foothold in a city with a good livelihood. I argue it's about their strategy. It's not about what we have to build for them or what we have to provide for them, about what decency they ought to have. It's about, it has to start like you would in any business. You start and say, how do we serve their strategy? How do we enable them to achieve their objectives? That's how we're gonna have a customer relationship. That's the mentality I brought to this. But I would argue that, uh, broadly speaking, as a development policy, one needs to understand the strategy of the urban migrant and the city that they're building and why they build the city the way they do, and then figure out how to help them to do that even better. Um, so they go to the city because there's these core economic geographic things, urban agglomeration. You're studying it, I know, no doubt. Um, and so you go there and what you do, you, you arrest a location. You get a flower station on the side of a new street, right? Um, you um, put a plastic tarp up uh, at night uh, on a street in uh, old Mumbai. At that location, you work with others to co-locate things to make your business even more optimized, more and more efficient, your livelihood more and more efficient, reducing your costs. Um, out of doing that, you create a market dynamism. There is an organic growth of market activity. Um, and then once you learn how to create that market, you export it, you extend it to other places. And India is very unique in this regard in that to the, regardless of what one would say the caste system provides as a negative in terms of social dynamics, it's also a tremendous force I found in interviewing urban migrants in um, making this strategy predictable and reliable for people from that caste community. And we've seen this over centuries. The Chetiars from southern India became the bankers of, of Asia, of Southeast Asia in particular. The Nadars, who became the retailers of cities um, throughout India. In Toronto, you I know it's true in New York. Um, I don't know what caste they're from, but the Punjabis, people from the Punjab control the trucking and the taxi industry. There's a whole system in by which we scale these things up. You learn how to seed it, how to capitalize it. You have family connection. You have caste community connection that help you scale this and take it globally. And there's two ways this will happen. This will happen. This process will happen because it's got a core economics to it that is undeniable. It can happen this way, right? We can plan. We can anticipate it. We can say there will be let's say out of 485 million, let's say there'll be 200 million migrants who will follow this path. We can figure out how to provide legal tenure. We can figure out how to create a taxation relationship that allows us to service that land, that set, allows us to put some standards around it. We can figure out how we can provide capital flow so that the best technology can apply to the housing construction, to the types of machinery that they use, um, standards around separating certain noxious activities from residential activities we can figure out how to apply the society's law to that place. Um, we can figure out how to encourage small producers to be part of the supply chain of global companies. All of this can be organized and business processed out. And I'm going to give some examples to uh, prove uh, the viability of that before we're done this evening. Or it can happen this way. And this is how it's happening, right? Um, people are invading land or they're creating land. Um, once they're on the land, they're extorted in order to maintain. They're extorted by the police. They're extorted by extortionists. Um, uh, and so from the beginning, you're interfacing with a criminal world that is sucking off of you, exploiting you, just like you were exploited by the middlemen uh, out in the village. You have to live in substandard dwellings. Um, you build your business through informality, and you count on criminal organizations in order to capitalize it. So the whole flow of money in Dharavi is based on the development of criminal, now they call them criminal companies. So the companies that formed in Dharavi and other slums in India are now multinational criminal organizations, uh, very involved in the opium trade in, in Afghanistan, uh, major property owners in, in Dubai and in London. So these are big, big uh, uh, conglomerates that now have merger and acquisitions with other criminal organization conglomerates around the world. So this parallel law, uh, quotes, um, you know, provides a way to scale up 
the black market economy, which is a huge part of our global economy these days. Um, and you can e extend or export it through contract labor. So one of the things Dharavi is, it's a hub for people to get labor contracts to go work in du Dubai. So there's different ways to do it, and the argument is, is there a way we can systematically do what's at the top in order to achieve the same uh, economic outcomes or to, let's say, follow the same economic strategy as what people are forced to do now. And what I think is most compelling about this is, if you work from that strategy and the economics behind it, you, what you're doing as a society is leveraging the resources and the efforts and the ingenuity of the people of a country to self-build. And a lot of countries have done this. We could talk about our own country here in the United States. So can India solve its problem by enabling the self-build city, the incrementally built city, or do we have to master plan it out? Do we have to go back to uh, British planning of the mid-20th century and say we ought to do what the Brits did? Uh, after our independence. Let's go copy what they did and that they find is wrong. Um, uh, before we move on to that question, um, it's important to say not only is there now this criminal cycle of capitalization of the slum, but now there's remittances through the extension, you know, through people doing their contract labor in Dubai or many other more positive things, getting jobs in London as young professionals. But it's an amazing flow of money that's now coming back to um, these inform the informal sector in India. Um, so this is a parallel economy. It's not a slum. It's a vast underserved economic geography. It extends globally. It's not just that hilltop slum. It's connected, just like every other economic activity in the world is connected into a global economy. And what it needs is land access and tenure. It needs capital. It needs to be fairly serviced. And it needs product. In other words, it needs building types uh, street design that are fit for the purpose of the people at the stage they're at in their development and their investment. What's been done over the years is to um, first sort of try to get some land. Frankly, I'll just put it that way. In other words, if we could just intensify where the poor people live by putting them in a cheap, risky high rise, we could capture the remaining land and then we could build something else on it for, say, the middle class. Um, and that's the process that's been happening in Mumbai for some time. Um, people abandon these buildings. Why do they abandon them? Because the, the product that they need customized for them has to allow them to access the market and do their business and reside at the same time. A unit where you just live is not economical, right? Um, so the, the, that notion of we'll live here in that building and then we'll pay money for another building to do our business and we'll pay money for another building to do recreation. Rich societies do that. And in our society, we have subsidized that. The, our fiscal wealth uh, of the government has subsidized that kind of living. These people can't afford that kind of uh, uh, capital uh, expenditure. So they abandon it and they go back down and have a shack because that's where they can live. You can build better buildings um, for them as well. Um, but it still doesn't turn the slum into something else. It's still a slum. They're just what they call high-rise slum. Um, we've been there. Um, so we did public housing in the United States, and now we're blowing them up. Um, so India has been experimenting the last two decades with that as a solution, um, and it's not been working. Um, so um, I think somewhat influenced by Professor uh, Prahalad, Ratan Tata, and, and Tata set up a housing company to try to do the nano house. Let's put a modular house, a, an IKEA flat house on the market for $700, and we'll get a plot of land, and we'll, now we've got the kind of garden city thing going on here. You know, it always looks beautiful on paper. If you look at the public housing projects in North America um, that we built in the 50s and 60s, they all looked like that exactly, and now we're tearing them down and reinvesting in them. But um, this is one of the first developments that they're doing. It, it came out just like the nano car with great fanfare. I tried to Google and get updates on it. My hunch is it's being canceled. There's hardly any internet activity about it whatsoever. I found one complaint from one buyer. He'd been waiting for a year to have his unit completed, and my impression is these, this isn't going forward. I uh, did find this video, so this is what it looks like. It just looks like what we were just looking like, except it's new. It's not run down yet. Um, but you'll see there isn't this co-location. There isn't this density. There isn't this conglomeration economies. In fact, this is where it is. So Dharavi is A. And this development, imagine the cost. So if your livelihood is in, in the core of Mumbai and you're going to live in that place, people will buy that. 
I mean, I know car drivers who, you know, once a week they drive three hours out of the city to where their family is probably li living in some rundown place. So it's an upgrade for them, but it's not an economical uh, solution for 485 million people, or at least for the 200 million that would be urban migrants. Um, I would even argue that a lot of this stuff that was built by the private sector in India over the last decade is not economical either. So I, I spent some time looking at the higher end stuff that was put on the market, and this is very much like what you'd see in Miami. Um, Non-resident Indians bought a lot of this stuff. Um, but when the subprime crisis happened, a lot of this stuff went bad. It went sour. And what was interesting to me is to track what was the activity cycle there. So it's just like North America, um, people only in the homes at night, there's a shopping mall here uh, on the right-hand side. The shopping mall is dead during the day. This whole logic of co-locating your economic life and residential life is lost here. It's an Anglo-British way of thinking about serving a very different society with very different needs. So what this does is says, yes, you come to the city, we'll secure the location. You won't have to deal with gangsters and extortionists and corrupt officials in order to secure tenure. And we'll service it, and there'll be some standards. But you know, what you're not getting is a strategy there. What you're getting is utility. And at the end of the day, what are, why are people going? It's a strategy, stupid. It's a strategy about how I get my kid to be a professional, and that kid goes off to university in London, and now I got remittances. So there's a much bigger strategy here uh, that is not served by offering people a house. Um, and so there's something in this that I think is powerful that needs to be studied, and people are now beginning to study it. Um, and we have some old ideas, those who study um, urban planning and urbanism, urban studies generally. Uh, about what an urbanism is, um, that it's actually the engagement, the enfranchisement of people and their alignment in pursuing a strategy through urban investment together that actually solves the problem that meets the need that they're trying to serve. In Austin, Texas, that's been figured out. Um, all over the United States, after the abandonment of our downtown cores because of the shopping malls and um, uh, flight to the suburbs, what happened? A group of new users came in. They had a new vision of what this downtown could be used for. And you got South by Southwest. And you've got a branded district, um, once again, that is an amazing economic engine. Um, in a, in for Austin, for Texas, uh, on a country level, it's meaningful. In Canada, we know South by Southwest. That was self-organized, right? No one said, let's provide them with this. We enabled that. We have a society that enables that kind of thing. Central business districts are the same, right? They are business communities that look after their interests. They ensure that they continue to optimize their location. So downtown Toronto now can offer 20-year fixed price contracts on heating and cooling in a world where energy prices are tremendously unpredictable because they worked with the city government to create a district heating and cooling system using our lake water. That's what we do with urbanism. We optimize location. So why would we think anything differently for the self-building, low-income people? So I see this as a strategic design issue, if I can throw out that piece of jargon. We need to think holistically about what kind of legal reform is required, how we engage, create that relationship between the local government and the migrant community that functions, that's not just one, it's one that's more transparent, that's not so extorting. What kind, how we more carefully choose what kinds of technology and building materials and building types are needed at what stage? So in other words, how do you design a building where people can co-locate in that way in order to achieve their strategy to do what's familiar with them and put standards behind it? And then how we enable those small businesses to more rapidly tie up with global companies as part of their supply chains. Walmart's got an amazing strategy now. They want to have, um, I think it's 20 million women um, in their supply chain in China and India in the next 10 years or something like that. So the global companies are seeking a supply chain solution. I'm in discussions with Unilever these days. They need to source new sustainable inputs into their products. So they're trying to tie up with small farmers. So the corporate sector is there. How do we? provide the um, setting for people in cities in order to engage in that way effectively and to accelerate that process. And so there are organizations in India these days, and I think these are the pioneers, 
um, one of the first organizations that actually did a census of Dharavi and that started advocating for street dwellers in Mumbai Spark, some of you may know of it, is now moving into the urban development space. They were building high-rise cooperatives for a while and I interviewed some residents of their high-rises outside of Dharavi and people said, life has been hell since we moved there because my husband lost his work, <clears throat> we have no water supply here, et cetera, et cetera. So and you can read uh, some of those accounts in my book. Um, they've decided to actually go back to figuring out how you do Dharavi, how you f implement that strategy in a way that has standards and quality to it, that is affordable at this stage as families accumulate wealth, how they can upgrade as they go. Um, we've done things like that. We've done transformational things like that here. Um, the United States came out of its industrial era with uh, hundreds of thousands of brownfield sites in our central cities. And they were nothing but liabilities. No one wanted to invest in them. And it really was at the point where the question was, could we re and redevelop our central cities because of contamination and liability? And we created a whole new market system to enable the reinvestment in that land. So I just point that out to say, this kind of holistic way of creating new law, <clears throat> in this case with Brownfields, new insurance products to insure people for environmental liability, new technology to clean up places, new business models to public-private partnerships, tax increment financing. We've done this here. Um, Indians are smarter than we are. Why can't we do this? I would argue perhaps because they're thinking too much like the British, but um, that was an inflammatory comment. But I mean, when one looks at urban, when one looks at what is being done in terms of urban planning solutions, and I would even say the non-resident Indians who return to India, who I've met, are still thinking in that garden city, mid 20th century way of thinking, whereas here in the United States, we've been much more sophisticated and nuanced and inventive in how we've managed our own urban problems. So here's a multinational group of urbanist architects, <coughs> engineers, sitting around a design studio in Mumbai, figuring out how to do this incremental city building strategy. And I think this is where India um, can begin to discover, and the Tatas of, of India can be begin to discover how to more effectively um, meet this demand of 485 million. I want to uh, speak to one other topic real quickly and then wrap up showing uh, with reference to Brazil and um, how Brazil has tackled this problem because I think maybe India learns more from a Brazil than it does from the United States. Um, what's an Indian roadway? So that's the other question. As they auto, as, as people get their nano cars, <clears throat> what's going to be a functional road in India? Is it this? Um, the first time I went on this road, I was astounded with the experience because I'd been living in Bangalore with my family and finally they opened up the new highway to the new international airport in Bangalore. And I sat on this road and said, what continent am I on? <clears throat> where are the cyclists? Where are the carts? Where are the auto rickshaws? Am I in India any longer? An Indian road is an economic space. It's an economic corridor, right? Yes, it has to provide for mobility, and it doesn't do it that well. Um, so there's a need for redesign. But it's also a place where people access market and make their livelihood. And so I th in a similar way, we need to think about how is the corridor, the transportation corridor, actually a place of business? Um, hopefully, it's not a place of living in a tent or living on the side of the road. But how do we begin to think about um, dividing the road in ways that people can still have, an Indian road can still serve all the functions that it serves today in a way that's better organized. This isn't too complicated. We have some civil, en civil engineers here tonight and we can talk about it. Um, the solution's not been found um, and clearly this doesn't seem to be working that well, but it's a begin of a logic that says, let's not change the function of the corridor. Let's figure out how we can redesign and reorganize the corridor to serve Indian needs better. Other countries have done this, and I'll close with this. Um, other countries for you know, whatever other set of historical reasons, and they've not done it countrywide, but there are examples of other cities, maybe it's a better way of putting it, uh, Coritiba, Brazil being one, that have wrestled with what's a Coritibano road? What is the road that our city needs? Or, or what is the flood control system that our city needs? And said, we're not importing solutions. We have a unique set of problems. We have a unique set of aspirations. So Curitiba uh, in the late 1960s um, had a private sector bus company based mode of public transit, not much different than India. The buses were all on concessions. 
The concessions violated all of the rules and standards. They were their mafias. Um, in this case, in the 60s, it was under a military dictatorship, and the mayor of Corachiva wanted to enforce them upgrading their buses. They have to buy new buses every few years. Um, they just went to the generals and cut a deal with the generals. So the mayor, Jaime Lerner of Corachiva, decided that he would co-op them. He would create an entirely new business model, giving them a better way to make money, and this is a whole other case study, and actually it's covered in the book as well. But the short of it is, is they designed a road system that had never been designed in the world before, a, a triennary road system. So on each side of these high rises here are um, express car lanes that go in and out of the city. One goes in, one goes out for express traffic. Then you've got the bus rapid transit system, and then you have local traffic. A road doesn't exist like that anywhere in the world, and it's now scaled up to serve more than 20 million people a day. The transit system generates a, an operating profit. It's probably the only transit system in the world that generates an operating profit, um, and uh, it's available to people within 500 meters anywhere in the city. So these things are uh, possible through uh, sophisticated redesign of law, of business models, of uh, physical space, and I would argue India um, can outdo Brazil. Um, finally, to close with Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's a city we've also heard a lot about in terms of favelas, its slums. Uh, no less than we've heard about Mumbai and its problems with its slums. Um, the extent to which the drug gangs and cartels controlled the slums, I mean, basically they were military compounds, and you see an example of it here in one of the favelas. It's interesting, the kids are smiling. I mean, this is just everyday life. Right? Um, Brazil, over the last 20 years, has decided to work with its slum dwellers. They were moving them to the periphery doing the Tata model back in the 60s and 70s. Um, you see films about the city of God now, and those became worse places where people abandoned them. They came back and settled on another hillside in Rio. So in the 20s, working with the Inter-American Development Bank, they decided, you know what, we're not going to displace the favelas we're gonna create a pathway for them to upgrade themselves. So they organized all the departments in the city government, the, um, the engineers, the water services, the sanitation services, the recreation, the childcare, the education, and they went as a group to each favela and they worked out a plan with that community for starting to give full municipal services to it and began to invest in upgrading their water system, their drainage system because they're on hillsides, and they customized the solutions for each favela. That was what was interesting. There was no carbon copy you know, standard. There were standards, but there, it wasn't a carbon copy of things. They, because the favelas are on different hills, and there are people from different places with different histories, uh, um, uh, different gangs controlling them, this kind of thing. So that's what they started with, and that was in the 1990s. And then in the late 1990s, they started saying to people, if you bring your house up to a new standard for favela houses, because we know you can't get up to the standards of a normal Rio house, but if you take it to the next level, we'll go to court and we'll give you land ownership there. So then they developed a legal innovation, the legal solution, and people started uh, investing in their homes. And then they started taking pride in their favelas in ways that they hadn't. They started branding their favelas. Um, and there was a lot that happened in this particular one in Hosinia. Uh, they became specialists in fashion garments. And so, you know, it's a quite well known story of some companies in Hosinia discovered by Paris fashion designers, and they've become kind of labels. Um, so Huzunia is now the Duravi of, uh, of, of Rio, where you can do slum tourism and, and hear this great story. Um, but a set of interventions, including finally um, a military intervention, where they reorganize the police forces. The police were often in cahoots with the drug gangs. That happens in other countries of the world, not to be mentioned. Um, and. Uh, they reorganized them and they basically militarily took control and have a military guard over the favelas until the gangs just sort of had disappeared. Now they're doing this to get ready for the Olympics, right? Because they intend to communicate something different to the world for the Olympics. Um, that Brazil is becoming a different kind of country. And I put this out because while I was in working in India um, in the last decade, um, all the talk was how to tear down Dharabi and get good housing there, you know, and to move those people out to something different. In Rio, after 20 years of this kind of an approach, um, they've made a commitment to preserving the favelas as cultural areas. Um, this favela in the area that will be the center of the Olympics in uh, 2016 um, is the place where samba 
originated. Um, so it will be a cultural district, and there's a whole set of interventions that are being made um, in order to enable, including the Brazilian Small Business Development Agency, to provide training, uh, ca uh, working capital to small businesses, there are, say, microenterprises there to scale up to become the small businesses that serve this new port redevelopment area in Rio. So I thought I would just close with that, I think, good news story of what is possible and what is being done in other parts of the world. I thought I would close with um, just reading something from my book um, from one of the days I spent uh, in Madurai, which is um, a sort of medium-sized city, a kind of first stopping point for people from rural Tamil Nadu um, into the urban world, uh, beginning their lives in Madurai, and then talking about what happened after they settled in Madurai. So I'm in a kind of swampy area on the periphery. They've put up quite nice houses there, concrete block houses. They're not shacks. Um, and it seems to have been settled maybe for 10 years, but there's no streets, there's no paths, there's animals all over. It's still kind of something between a village and a city on the end. And um, I'm talking with about a dozen women who have settled there. The men are out working in the middle of the day. A younger, quiet woman named Munishwari elaborates on their attitude about the city. She and her husband migrated from a small village in 1990, followed by her elder sister, who had already moved to the city. Her brother-in-law then introduced her husband to construction work, which now takes him to jobs in regions beyond Madurai. Quote, it's like a dream come true coming to Madurai, says Munishwari. I was born in a village and married to a villager, and I always dreamed of being in the city, and now I'm here. We say it is because of no rain that we left the village, she elaborates, but to move to the city is big and we want to move here. If there was plenty of rain, she says, almost appreciating the drought that triggered their move, we might not have come. My family thinks I'm more civilized because I live in the city. Another woman, Ishwari, was proud to report that her eldest son, born the year of her migration to Madurai, now studies computers at a polytechnic. Quote, my husband wants his children to go for other kinds of jobs, not for masonry. This group had gotten into masonry when they moved to the city, Ishwari explains. He suffered a lot in life because he's not educated. He has to work with cement. My son will go to an office and come home well-dressed. This generation wants to be neat, civilized, that word again. She emphasizes, if they are educated, they'll be civilized. Another woman injects that she has a niece that has recently married a young Madurai software engineer, and they're now living in London, UK. Along this pathway from village to the world of cities, the migrants of a single city experiment with hundreds of different strategies to secure their own little stake in the, cities ex in the global city's expanding markets. The migrant enters an informal economy of petty trade, microenterprise, and labor contracting that is governed only by the unique rules and cultural dynamics of the unofficial city. From an informal, even as the informal economy does the work of constructing the city and servicing it in its in its growing formal economy, migrant families and communities are working to build their own urban advantage. They would join this formal city if they could, but being barred from such enfranchisement in the official city, they will build a parallel city with its own advantages in the world of cities. And I think that's the key thing, is, is that if we don't figure this out, there will be a world of two globalizations, a world of two cities, and that's the thing that is the problem for all of us to solve. Thanks very much for being here tonight. Thank you very much. That was a very nice uh, talk and very enlightening. Um, our <coughs> urban strategy using local conditions and local solutions makes, a, makes good sense. But then at the other extreme, we see this huge number of 480 million people gravitating towards the urban areas. Uh, Brazil may not be a good comparison because the population is so small and it's possible to do that. How do you do that in a country like India when you have 480 million people possibly coming there? And the, at the same time, uh, I think China would be a little more comparable to India and there's been a tremendous migration of people from the rural to the urban areas. And how has China been able to manage the infrastructure and uh, yeah. Uh, urbanization. Yeah, yeah, and first of all, I want to say, and uh, I'll go back to something I said, if not <clears throat> implied or, or at least said at the beginning, which is I don't think what I'm arguing is the only, right, because of the scale of the solution. I think there are many experiments need to take place. I think all of the experiments need to, in order to be successful, 
need to work from the premise of why it is that people are making this move. Um, you know, we've gone through a period where initially the response to those numbers was, how do we keep them in the village? Um, and now people have sort of accepted, okay, yeah, we understand urban agglomeration. If people are coming, there's opportunity there. Now the discussion is, how do we keep them in the tertiary and secondary cities? Or how do we, you know, have people go to Madurai and stay in Madurai and have Madurai function as a place in which then they go to London, right? Rather than concentration in the Mumbai's and the Delhi's. And I think that's very important, that scaling comes not at the level of, you know, uh, you know the big metros of India, but even the tertiary cities. And that's where the self-building is still kind of already happening. Um, land is more affordable, and that, that's a critical, uh, as you were asking a question, I said the first piece is settling the land issue. Um, in, order to pr in order to serve this strategy, um, people have to be relatively centrally located within the urban cluster, right? Because they have to keep their cost structure down and they have to be close to markets. Otherwise, they're still back in the village and they're taking a truck back and forth carting their wares on, during market day or something like that. Um, so uh, if, if more of the migration could be satisfied by offering good um, incremental self-build supported solutions um, that are serviced places um, where there is working capital available to them to improve their homes, where it's allowed to build um, in, within the uh, formal building standards, uh, a workplace with a living unit, um, these kinds of things. And I think that that would address some part of the uh, issue. Um, in terms of China, uh, it's a very different place, of course. Um, I don't know to the, I don't know to what extent, and people here who have studied China, I'm not a sinologist, so I can't really speak to it. That's in that, what, let me say what I do know about. Indian urban migrants are very enterprising. They're very focused in on how to make their own livelihood, right? They're not looking for a government handout, really, because they don't trust government. Um, I worked with the microcredit sector a lot. They're not, they partner with microcredit, but microcredit is not their be all and end all. It's not their religion, right? They're very much like that grandmother who had six businesses she had invested in. Um, and for that reason, I think the Indian solution has to be tied in with what's your livelihood solution. So living and livelihood have to be done together. In China, my impression is it's been more about a housing solution and taking a job in a big manufacturing facility of some kind. Um, with all that said, there's two things that don't get talked much about in China, which is those um, RAND Corporation numbers that I showed early on, the amount of um, civil unrest in China often linked to destroying uh, informal market areas or destroying self-built housing areas, right? So the same struggle that has been threatened in Dharavi or stewing in Dharavi around tearing Dharavi down is happening in China. Uh, we don't hear as much about it, but the RAND study is very telling and the U.S. government is very concerned about the stability of China as the Communist Party of China is for that reasons, which is why they do that. That report was to the U.S. Congress. Um, the other issue is, is what's supporting all that housing investment in China? I mean, what, what's the bubble that we don't hear about? So was it really market-based investment or is it you know, part of that speculative um, recycling of uh, income that is happening that is being supported by the state bank, by the, by the government bank? So I don't know how viable all of that construction really is and hopefully we won't learn. <laughs> there won't be a crisis that will trigger it. But I, I think, I don't know how much we can compare that in, um, you're right to say that Brazil's not a perfect comparison because the scale issues aren't there. Um, but the studies have been done um, of some of these favelas in Rio. Now there's a 40-year longitudinal study about who came um, in a new favela and what's happened to the people of those lives. It's by a um, longer professor, Janice Perlman, um, who lived in a favela 40 years ago. And then she went back and lived in it 40 years later and did very um, intensive uh, research on what had happened to people. It's a similar kind of dynamic, you know, people who are in micro enterprise, who are self-employed people, and you know, that, that's really what I'm focusing in on is, is people who want to be self-employed. Um, I didn't mention when talking about Mumbai, 80% of the business establishments in Mumbai are in the informal sector. 
55% of the population, so six and a half million people in Mumbai live in so-called slums, right? So these are amazing numbers already, but I think the key thing is the informal sector is a huge, um, informal enterprise is really huge, and you need to build with that as a, as a critical factor in the way that you think about housing people. Mr. Boone, thank you so much for sharing with us. I have several questions, but I'll limit it. I wondered from when I looked at the first slide you had up of the, just the roofs of the tightly packed dwellings. Yeah. Is there any type of mail service to these areas? Really interesting. Um, there must be. I mean, the services are amazing. And I've been to, visited some other slum areas. Um, in fact, the one with the fancy carving was in an area in the northern suburb of Mumbai whose specialty is bar girls. And ex expand the concept of bar girls. Um, dancers, um, you know. So it's a complicated occupation, let's say. So that's the main kind of occupational cluster and the guys who guard them and stuff. But anyway, that's where that was happening, that, that artwork. So um, I've been to a few other areas, but Dravi's interested in terms of the diversification of, um, of its economy. So they have their own legal system. They have their own land titling system. And do they pay taxes? Um, they pay taxes internally, uh, but it's extortion, okay. right? Um, and if you don't pay your taxes, you might get, like uh, I interviewed and I write about an extortionist in, in the book, one of the local gangsters who's really a small time guy. He has a foundation and he asks people to make donations to the foundation. He's a slumlord, so. He's collecting rents on taxes, but it's a donation foundation. Um, he extorts from local businesses. Uh, he had put a baker in an oven the previous week. So it, it's, a, it's a nasty world. But what I want to say is um, when I went to visit this lawyer who does land um, sales, right? It's not within Indian law, right? But they've worked out their own legal system. They all have titles that are informal, but it's all they're all respected. So you, there was a line outside the lawyer's office door for people making land transactions. Um, just about any service you can imagine in any economy has been um, informally established in the parallel world. And taxation, it may be extortion, but it's, you know, it serves the same function. Last, this is it. Okay, I promise. Because um, my students are studying India now and we're talking about the caste system. So when you have the micro enterprises at the lowest level and they become well off, are they still staying at their? They are because of the, you know, and here's the whole thing. So I spent a lot of time with the leather people who are at the core of the opposition of uh, tearing down Dharavi. Um, and they have a, a number of uh, reasons for it, access to labor. So their labor is cheaper and works longer hours because they don't have to commute and they, so they don't lose time commuting and they don't spend money commuting, right? So they're, um, and, and that, that wage can be depressed because living there is cheaper, right? Because you don't have to commute to make a living. So if you move out to that place that Tata is building, you're gonna need a bigger wage to support your family. Um, also, uh, because it's close to the airport and when their fashion designers come in from Paris, it's easy to get to Dharavi. So um, there's all, they've moved to Bandra, which is a very middle class, more upscale neighborhood. So they have a Bandra house. They also have a house in Dharavi, um, partly that my guess is, I mean, you never get the full elaborate story in the kind of surface research that someone like me can do. Um, they're protecting things by being there. You know, there's probably a number of arrangements that are in place that allow their business to function the way it functions. They're part form, they have a legal company, but there's, I would argue, there's gotta be a lot of under the table stuff that's going on when you look at the numbers. Um, you know, but. That's not, I know a lot of people in business in Toronto who've got kind of both things going on as well, so I don't know if it's too different anyway. 